Um, so let's start with our first topic, which is going to be an overview of concurrent programming concepts. We will cover concurrent programming, and we will also talk about parallel programming. And this will give you an overview of things we will cover in this class, as well as things we will not be covering in this class, because there's some things that we're not going to be covering. So what is concurrency? That's a good place to start. Before we can talk about concurrency, however, it probably makes sense to take a step back and talk a bit about sequential programming. So what is sequential programming? So sequential programming is a form of computing where the instructions are executed in a particular sequence and you always get the same results because they always execute in the same way. So I always love metaphors. You will see visual metaphors and analogies on all my slides. So when I think about sequential, I think about a drive-through at a fast food restaurant like McDonald's or Arby's or whatnot, where each thing is done one at a time. So it's basically sort of like a, a flow of instructions, a flow of cars, and so on. What that means is execution is deterministic. There's no randomness, no non-determinism, unless, of course, you use a random number generator, but I'm not including that. So you, you always get the same result, and things essentially execute in the same order. So it's very very much in lockstep. There are two primary characteristics of sequential programs that are worth noting. One is that the textural order of the statements in your code is going to determine the order that things get executed. So if you have code that looks like this, here's a, here's a piece of a snippet of the code from the Java ArrayList implementation for the get method. We're first going to check what the range is and then we're going to go ahead and return the element data if the range was valid. And so this gets done, range check gets done before element data is accessed. Pretty straightforward. I'm sure you've all written code like this. This should be no, no big surprise here. Another characteristic of a sequential program is that successive statements must execute without any temporal overlap that's visible to programmers or programs. So in other words, again, things are kind of done in locks up. Think like, you know, knocking down the dominoes, right? One falls, the next falls, the next falls. It goes in sequence. Now, under the hood, the underlying hardware instruction processor, the underlying assembler can rearrange the low-level instructions to do things like prevent pipeline stalls or whatnot, uh, or to be able to rearrange the code so it runs faster. But those types of optimizations have to be invisible to the program with respect to the order in which things execute from the point of view of what the results are. So they can rearrange things a little bit, but it's pretty much kind of peephole optimization-like stuff and uh, not something that should ever show up and affect the correctness of your code. All right, so that's sequential programming. My guess is that that's mostly what you've done. If you've done other kinds of programming, that's great, but this is probably what you've experienced through much of what you've done here at Vanderbilt. <laughs> So what is concurrent programming? Well, concurrent programming is a form of computing where threads can run simultaneously. And we'll see that there's different definitions of simultaneous. Sometimes we think about things as physically simultaneous, like they really are running at the same time, say, on different cores in a multi-core processor. Sometimes we think about it being logically simultaneous, basically being there's one core and the threads take turns running on that one core. But the concept is simultaneous. So here's a picture that kind of illustrates this. We've got a, a process, which is this little round angle, grayish round angle. And we've got a bunch of little squiggly lines in there, which are threads. And they're communicating by sharing information or passing messages and so on. What is a thread? A thread, historically, in Java, is a unit of execution for instruction streams that can run concurrently on one or more processor cores. And there's some nuances to this we'll talk about in just a bit. But basically, here's an example where we're going to go ahead and have a little loop that goes for i equals 0, i less than 5. And we're going to say new thread. And we're going to give it some computation to run. And we're going to start the thread. And so what will happen is we'll end up with five threads that will be running. And those threads will be multiplexed over the underlying processor cores. Again, my love for a visual analogy, right? This is a processor core, or four processor cores. They're Apple processor cores. So uh, basically the idea here is that you can have multiple threads, probably more threads than cores typically, that can be multiplexed on top of them or scheduled to run on them. Now, 
with modern Java, as we'll talk about later, there's some interesting nuances to all this, but we won't talk about them at the moment. You could also have a scenario where you have multiple threads that are multiplexed over one core. Let's say there's only one core on your computer, which was the case for computers up until about 10, 15 years ago. This is actually increasingly rare. It's actually getting hard to buy a single core computer. Almost everything is being made with multiple cores. And that's, again, because of what we were talking about earlier about Moore's law and the number of transistors on the chip and so on. So what's the difference between a sequential program and a concurrent program? Well, one of the big differences is that different executions of the concurrent program can produce different instruction orderings. And that's because of the inherent non-determinism. You're not just running on one core anymore. You're running on many. You're potentially running on many. So you may end up with different ways in which things execute. In particular, the textual order of the source code no longer necessarily defines the execution order. So here's a simple example where we're going to spawn three threads. And after these three threads are spawned and each of them have a chance to run computation A, computation B, computation C, A, B, and C, the A, B, and C computation can actually run in any order. It doesn't really matter. So you can, um, it's any order after the threads start to execute. It can be any order that happens to be the way that the hardware works or the software works or whatnot. Moreover, operations are permitted to overlap in time across the multiple cores. So instead of doing things you know, one at a time sequentially in lockstep, you can actually have things running and overlapping. And one core may be running, one core may be paused. Two cores can be running. They can be doing different kinds of things. And as you might imagine, this is both a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing because it may enable your programs to run faster because more things are going on at the same time. It could be a curse if you have conflicts and hazards and race conditions and visibility issues between the operations running on the different cores. And we'll talk a little bit about that, although that topic is really outside the scope of this course for reasons we'll talk about later. In practice, people typically use concurrent programming to offload work from certain threads, typically the, the main thread or the user interface thread, onto one or more background threads. And this is very common in modern GUI-based mobile devices. So let's imagine we have Android. And Android has something called the user interface thread or the UI thread. And it's doing all the user-facing stuff, displaying menus and dialogues and output to the user on the screen, on the touch screen. And then the computations that are taking place typically occur in one or more background threads. And there's a whole bunch of reasons for that. You can take a look at this to learn more about it. But the long and short of it is, in modern GUIs like Android, and this applies for iOS as well, you don't want the main thread, the UI thread, to block for any length of time because it makes your application not responsive. So instead, we do longer running computations in background threads, and then they communicate back and forth. So background threads can block because they aren't interfering with the user interface. The user interface thread, there's one of them, is not supposed to block. It could block, but if you block, it's a bad thing, and you'll get an application not responding exception on Android. And anything that you need to share between those different threads has to be protected in some way or another. And we'll talk in just a little bit about ways to protect the state. And there's a couple different ways to do it. One way is to use synchronizers, which are basically ways of making sure that only one thing happens at a time. Another way to do it is to pass messages around, which kind of use synchronizers under the hood. Another way to do it, which we'll talk about in this course a lot, is not to share state in the first place. And then the whole problem just goes away. So we'll talk more about that in just a little bit. Shared mutable state is the root of all evil in concurrent programs. So we'll talk just a teeny weeny bit about synchronizers in this course, things like arrangement locks, things like uh, condition objects, things like barrier synchronizers, things like atomic variables, atomic operations. This is not really the course, however, that goes into detail about synchronizers. That's my sibling course that I teach in the spring. So that's the end of the overview of concurrent programming concepts. We will continue to deepen this, of course, in upcoming lessons.